I'm Lynette Creamer, and I was with the Omni Group, and I recently started a new position for Media Alpha, where we do programmatic advertising. But there's a specific reason I wanted to come speak about caring for new developers, and that's because in 2017, in my position as a software tester, we introduced JavaScript as a way to script between Mac and iOS, and I wanted to set up data for my testing projects. So I signed up for this nine-month developer course in JavaScript at the University of Washington. And as we began the class, there were 15 men and 15 women at the start of the class. Nine months later, oh wait, 30 men and 30 women. So at the end of the class, we had 15 men get their certificate and four women, including me, finish. And so I wanted to talk about some of the difficult situations that happen, not to bemoan the problems that we have, but just to equip you with some specifics about how we can do better than this. Because um, there are a few people who mean harm to new developers and are gatekeepers. But by and large, I think most everyone wants to help new developers. And most of the harm happening is absolutely unintentional. And the willingness to help new developers is already there. The problem is the skills to do it well and the information of how to help someone isn't really out there. So I believe most people are sincerely doing their best to be welcoming to new developers, but it's still not necessarily happening. So I want to talk about five things. First, why does it matter from a business and a human perspective that we care for our new developers? Second one, how can we encourage confidence when the learning curve is steep and it's so overwhelming? Um, then first, I want to talk about how to do no harm before anything else. And then uh, I want to talk about proven tactics to encourage learning. And then the last thing is how can we know if we are welcoming and caring for our new developers how can we find good coding mentors and coaches? And um, I've added my Twitter, so tweet away if you want. If you have questions, I don't think we're going to even have time to get to them. So just at me on Twitter, and I will happily answer them. I made this Venn diagram because I think, in general, the way that we judge the skill of other developers is very self-centered. Um, the good developers are people who know about as much as I do. Then. There's absolute geniuses, people above my level. And then there's idiots, everyone who's where I was years ago. And um, in my interviewing, I've encountered this model so many times. Um, but I just want to remind you that people who are starting out aren't idiots. They're just new. And it's very different, a very different thing. Um, they may have not been exposed to some ideas. So how can we be a strong team? if our own ego matters more than the team. Um, and I think this model is part of why our hiring in tech is notoriously bad, and we can do better. So what I'd like to see is to respect the tenacity and growth of those who are learning, respect the work and the genius of those who are at our level, and also respect the fallibility and experience of those who have more ability than we do, and realize that we're going to be there one day. So I think one thing we do is we focus on hiring for programming ability above everything else. Um, that's even true for SDEP positions. I've interviewed for several of them. Seven people stared at me in a white room with no warning. I could have messed up writing my name. I was so scared. It was pretty bad. Your ability to write excellent algorithms doesn't make you an effective senior developer. And your, but your ability to grow other developers, that's what makes a better team member. Like, you can never be more powerful than one developer unless you can grow other developers. That's how we get better as a group. So why does it matter? The longer it takes to hire someone, the more HR, management, and team time, and your lead time, it takes away from the projects you're trying to work on to find a replacement. So I calculated this based on averages of 2018 if you don't even count in the cost of morale, the risk of your project failing, the cost of the lost knowledge, or the fact that your new developer just went to your competitor, you've still lost 
almost 12,000 pounds, just in effort. Your company is competing with the Googles of the world, large companies. And so, in general, on average, your hiring process sucks. You're trying to hire the same developers with three to nine years' experience with this really annoying checklist that you know, half the people applying don't meet. And um, so that's kind of why these positions are vacant for so long. And you're still hiring in the time you could have had someone you've up-leveled to those skills. And then, um, especially when it comes to women and minority candidates, developers are now very cautious about where they work. And we have lots of ways to get information. My last job I got on Alpha, I posted my, and that's a space for people who identify as women in tech, and I posted my resume, and a lady reached out to me with a job I didn't even know existed. And she said, I think you'd be great for this job, and it is a good match. But had someone else told me, don't work for this company. I worked there, it was terrible. They didn't stand up for me, they didn't protect me. They ran me down and criticized me all the time. So basically, your team and company reputation are in stake, at stake, based on what it's like to join your team as a developer. Um, on average, criticizing someone does not result in improving their performance. That is a myth, if you've heard that, that telling them what they're doing wrong will help them be better. What it does result in is that person avoiding you and seeking out allies to help restore their self-esteem and to feel OK and respected again. There's this thing called the golden ratio. It's a five to one ratio of positive to negative interactions to sustain a relationship. But with a new developer, you don't have a relationship yet. So the ratio is more like seven to one, seven positives to one negative to build up a relationship and trust so that they can even hear your advice when you have something to tell them. Your job is not to prevent new developers from making mistakes if you're trying to welcome a new developer. Your job is to help them fix the mistake quickly and have the confidence to keep taking risks and to not have the mistake they made result in fear of them committing more code. So showing a lack of faith in a new developer, it can cost you more in productivity and loss morale than the time it takes to walk them through moving forward, especially at first, until they know Mistakes are normal, and fixing them is what we do. A uh, couple things to do for encouraging confidence. Don't fix the problem for them, but explain what needs to, a change that needs to be made with an example. Someone at my work did this for me recently. It was so helpful. And then check your assumption, if you're pairing, on what half the time is. Use an actual timer, because uh, Time is a funny thing with how we perceive it. Um, so let them drive half the time and make sure it's half the time. So the minimum viable product of helping new developers is to be better than a rubber duck. So if you can't listen quietly without harming someone, your performance is worse than an inanimate object. Um, I've also seen people just take over the keyboard without saying a word which is pretty rude. So if you have that habit, just try sitting on your hands as an example. Um, think back to when you're a child and you're learning to ride a bike. You start out with training wheels, and then someone will hold the back of your bicycle as you pedal. And then they let go, and they let you go forward and help you pick it back up if you fall. But I've never seen anyone learn to ride a bike by watching someone else. I mean, a BMX rider who's an expert could come in, go off the ramp, start doing flips, you still don't know how to ride a bike. It's like, yeah, you're really cool. Thanks for showing me that, but I still can't ride a bike. So in order for someone to grow their skill as a developer, they have to code. And if you're a leader, a senior developer, it's your job to make sure the people on your team who cannot meet this bar of at least being as good as a rubber duck do not interact with your new developer until they're better. Um, because they haven't met the bar of responsibility. They have to at least be as good as this duck. And it doesn't matter how talented you are as a developer if no one wants to work with you and no one wants to work for you. You're never going to be more than just like one person. But what if you're busy and you just need to quickly get something done? 
Well, if you're busy, and we're all busy, then you might have to have some of this come back later when you're less busy. As long as you don't drop it, a delay is okay. So I wanted to talk about feedback. Um, you know you're giving good feedback if it's an invitation to a discussion. A feedback should never be a chance to dump on someone or just drop your opinion on them. It's a two-way discussion for clarification. Um, I like to say, I observed this, rather than you did this, you did that. I saw this, and try and invite the conversation. An example is way better than an explanation, especially with a code problem. But an explanation is still better than a vague complaint. So there's levels of how constructive criticism is. And I also hope that you will show people what you do want, not just tell them what you don't want. Because saying what you don't want is just this guessing game, and you just, it makes you feel like you have to guess, and if you don't guess right, then all you're getting is more negative, more negative. It's demoralizing. And also think about uh, what difference does it make, especially if you're giving feedback about small things, like does it make a huge difference? Are you sure you're even right? that it's the better way to do things. And instead of saying something like, never do this, say, hey, I'm concerned about this. What would it look like if we did that? So think in terms of code that's working, code that's better than working, and code that is the best in your code base, and incremental improvement. Let good and better be good enough for now but reward progress. When you're solving hard problems, failure is always an option. It can happen at any time, and it probably will. If a new developer on your team is failing and you're not sure why, consider if your care is lacking and possibly not their talent and intellect. I want to tell you a story. In my class, I had this homework, and I was really frustrated because I'd been working for hours. I'd talked to my teacher on IM. I was stuck in one spot, and so I had someone help me that knows JavaScript. And I explained, I said, I'm stuck right here. Here's how far I am. I put a comment right there, like, I'm stuck here. I don't know what to do here. And they left, and in a half an hour, they handed me back my homework, all of it completed. That did not help me. Um, it said to me they didn't believe I could do my own homework. Like, I asked them for one specific thing, they solved everything. Now, maybe they needed to solve everything to make sure their answer was correct, but they could have just answered my question and kept the rest of it out of there, so I had a chance to work through the puzzle. Telling someone it's hard, it's too hard to explain this to you. It's just too hard. I'm just going to fix this bug. It's too hard to explain to you. I don't have time. Okay, that's valid if it's really a blocking issue, as long as it's not your final answer and you only use it in case of emergency. So the loss of confidence when you're out there showing off how skilled you are to your new developers and putting that above their learning, it may turn into self-doubt and even imposter syndrome. I believe we have way less imposter syndrome than is talked about and way more bad behavior that undermines people as they're learning. So I know you're busy, and I know it's critical that you get your new developer constructively checking in code and contributing with confidence. So um, the code consistency and code quality and how your developer feels, these are related. You can't perform well if you're doubting everything you do. You have to have a certain level of confidence to even commit code. So I want to say some things that actually happened. And it's kind of a bummer, but um, I. When I first first learning to code, I showed my code to someone, and they said, this code is terrible. Don't show it to anyone. And that's like, why would you even say that? Um, they didn't even say why it was terrible, but it, it doesn't matter. Then I had another person I showed my code to say, you're a very procedural thinker. OK, what does that mean? Considering that I started on DOS writing batch files, and that's all we had at the time, Maybe I am a procedural thinker, but how much better would it have been if they said, OK, let's break this down into separate groups, see how much easier to maintain this is, and here's how we link them together, and I'm not assuming you know that yet. So that would have been a lot more helpful if they did it. 
Another quick story. I had a developer um, who worked really hard on a new feature. Um, it was a platform thing, and they focused really hard, took a whole bunch of courses, and then integrated this new platform feature, checked it all in, and then someone way higher in the organization just redid it, checked in their code over her code. And it may have not been the only reason, but this person soon left the company. And I think they could have paired on it and made a few tweaks and it would have been better and it wouldn't have cost a good developer um, on the team. So there's a thing about employee hierarchy. It really matters if you're higher in role and respect how you treat the code of those under you for their confidence. And you know, even having a flat structure doesn't make it go away. In a flat structure, everyone on your team can still draw the power structure. It just makes it less visible. It's still there. We all know it exists. I can draw it out. I think most of us can. So be aware of where you are in the hierarchy and if you're communicating with someone, and don't just like write over their code without speaking with them. People will refactor your code when you're gone. Your code will not last forever, but they will never forget how you made them feel, especially when they're starting out. So the only thing that really lasts is how you're treating the other people around you. If you hear yourself saying just or it's trivial, refactor your verbal output. That is a problem. And it, this whole, uh, you know, quickly interacting with people without thought, it's robbing your future productivity for short-term gains that don't last, and it's doing harm. Um, but if something's truly blocking, definitely put it off and then loop back when you have time and solve a similar problem together until you trust that developer to solve that same kind of problem next time. And it may take a few times. When you're doing code review, there's some phrases to look out for. One of them is confusing or doesn't make sense. Which part is confusing? To whom? What would be better instead and why? Complicated. So why is it complicated? Does it need to be? What would simplify it? What are you suggesting? Don't just say, too complicated. Why don't you just, or uh, when you write, why don't you just, just think, why don't I just not write that? It's just a bad thing to write in general. It's condescending. So replace with what would it look like if we did this, or how about that? Just anything that's not, doesn't come across as condescending. So by protecting and nurturing people who are writing code, you're protecting both the code quality and the people. You don't have to choose one or the other, and you really can't. It's not possible. So how do we protect the learning and keep people growing? I had to tell someone that I didn't know what they meant by good code, because it's not the same everywhere. Everywhere you go, people have different ideas of what good code looks like. Yeah, there's a few things in common. But you need to have examples. So when you get a new developer, maybe start them reading through the best code in your code base. What is the best code you have? And uh, one thing that I've seen work well is have them go line by line and comment through some code what they think it's doing. And that way, you can meet with them and clarify it. And then if they're missing any major concepts, good. You can point them in a place to solidify the concepts that they're missing and, and help them practice. And then once you've done that, have them write similar code and then come to you when you get stuck. But what if they don't come to you when they're stuck? If your new dev is never interrupting you, then set up a 30-minute time to check in with them and then stop work. Your 30 minutes is just to mentor them. Don't work during it um, unless you're working with them. And keep trying. So just say, it's really OK to interrupt me and display that. But mention exceptions, too. It's OK to interrupt me unless my headphones are on, unless I have a sign on my chair, unless my door is closed. Whatever it may be, let them know what the exceptions are so that they will interrupt you. So how will you know if you're doing, thing, if you're doing this right? How will you know if we're making improvement on welcoming our new developers? Can your new developer give an enthusiastic, uh, whoa, enthusiastic, <laughs> 
a passionate yes to, I have everything I need to effectively contribute my best work as a team member. If not, fix what's missing. So listen to what your new developers ask for as far as improvements go, whether that be to the code, the process, whatever it is. Think about who's likely to leave your team in the next year. What would it look like to turn that around? Do you pay all your developers equally? Would you know if you didn't? How can you fix it? Does everyone on your team feel supported and able to grow equally? Everyone has a voice, but not everyone is listened to. Do people join the company and stay? That's the bottom line. If that's improving, you are caring for your new developers well. As far as code review goes, in order to help both the code and the people who work there, read it, and you need to actively curate better code review. The norm in code review should be a two-way respectful discussion of ideas. If you find there are some unprofessional code reviewers participating, remove them temporarily and mentor them to become better code reviewers. Giving good code review should matter as much or more than the code you write. It is that vital that we do it well. How do we find a good mentor? They care personally about the person long-term, not short-term, not just what code can they churn out today. So long-term growth from a brand new, fresh-faced developer to a grizzled long beard is going to take time and experience. And of course, this is obviously an example of a female developer. We're going to grow a long gray beard. We stay long enough. Um, so the opposite of a good mentor is a pedantic know-it-all with low self-esteem who makes everything about themselves. Anyone who tells you they are, quote, too busy for this work should be seen as a warning sign and maybe not a good coach or mentor for a new developer. You need someone who recognizes that the sacrifice is temporary. I am investing time so I have a developer I can rely on on my team who I can trust to write good code. I'm investing in them because this is not wasting my time. This is an investment in the future so we have great developers. But overall, respectful, nice people are who you need to care for your new developers. But don't forget this person's also a cheerleader, like behind the scenes. Growing the positive reputation of new developers is a huge thing. Because when you start out, you know how much you don't know. You see it every day. People, you're learning new things every day. Growing a positive reputation is what a good mentor does and they are positive about what's working to your face. They tell you the truth about what needs to change. And then they're also singing your praises when they're deserved, and they sincerely can do so behind the back of that developer. So I feel like with a few tweaks, we can go from doing a pretty poor job of welcoming new developers to being awesome at it. And I feel like uh, consistency is easier if we just have fewer communication barriers. If we really stay in Agile, the whole team is in charge of quality. That means everyone, from the newest developer to the most senior developer on the team, has to feel welcome and comfortable to improve the code. And it, that's what we get if we help our new developers adjust to writing good code. Making things better for everyone is the easiest path forward to diversity. Because if we make things better for everyone and we make them more fair, it's pretty, it, it helps everyone, but it also has a big impact on those that are struggling the most. Reducing stress helps your physical and mental health. When you're coaching new developers, model healthy boundaries, and that means taking breaks lunch away from your desk, using your vacation, going on parental leave, and putting your well-being above business priorities. Because we each have one life, sacrificing health and happiness for the workplace is a losing game, and it can't even be sustained, and it doesn't make any of us better at what we do. Using factual constructive feedback based on the science of what works to reduce bias in performance reviews 
is another great thing to do. So I say skilled leaders who reward what matters with less bias. That means when it's possible, look at the work with no identifying information. By that, I mean you don't know who wrote this code while you're reviewing it, whether that be in the hiring, whether that be in looking at performance reviews, be in promoting, anything you can do to level the playing field from who did it to what the work is will help reduce bias. These are my cats, that Adolin and Navani. I miss them very much. So I feel like hiring developers who are already good is what the whole industry is trying to do. The three to seven years of experience that everyone's looking for with a giant laundry list, that's not special. You can have better developers at your company sooner by doing just slightly better at nurturing and growing new developers. And the other thing is, have you tried hiring for learning aptitude and also mentoring ability, especially in those higher positions? Because if we only focus on someone's code and not how they can grow other people, then the team never gets as effective as they could otherwise. So being the best place to grow as a new developer means you have a new supply, a more diverse supply, fresh ideas. And when I say a new developer, I don't just mean young. I mean people retraining from their jobs. What it means is you have fewer years of bad habits to break. And that can be a great place to start from. Thank you. Uh, do I have time for a few questions? Or is it lunch? Oh, I'm a technical program manager. No, I'm a technical program manager. <laughs> what that means? Oh, thank you. <laughs> but what I do is a uh, it's part client facing. And I work with customers uh, and also developers. So if a customer has a problem then, and there's an API integration, then I need to go through the code and find the problem and work with that engineer to fix it. So it's code facing and customer facing. It's the first time I've had a job that interacted with clients in a long time, so it's pretty fun. I like it. Oh, and if anyone wants to know about all the numbers I threw out and how I came up with those and a link, I'm super happy to send you the sources because I did actually look at the research and I just didn't have time to put them in, so I'm really happy to send you that if, if I can. We've got a few more minutes for questions if anyone has any. Have you got anything you can suggest for, um, so if you're in the position where you are the junior, how do you get the senior people to understand like those sort of things if they're not the people who come to see this and know this information? How do you kind of move that information up so you can get the good stuffs? There's three different areas to think about this. One is a systemic issue where we only reward individual code contribution and not the contribution to the team. And I don't know how we change that. I feel like it's really difficult, but it's starting to change. The thing you can do as a junior is literally avoid people who are harmful. Dismiss what they say. I don't care if you have to walk away from them. Do not listen to them. They suck, no. So filter your input. Some people should not be listened to. And then actively seek out the people who do support you and help give you good feedback. One thing I've done is I've paired with people online, and I've met some people that I really trust to pair with, and that's helped me a ton. Um, then the other thing you can do is find someone at your same level to practice with and learn from each other. So you can also do mob programming, and you can join mobs. Um, at conferences, I feel like there are groups that are really supportive and groups that are really toxic. And so it can take some time to find the right group. And then if your company culture is super bad, you can find a new job. 
<laughs> which I would recommend if you have to as a last resort. I hope some of that was helpful. Anyone else? Hello, just wanted to check when uh, recruiting someone in a senior position, apart from their individual coding skills and contribution, how can you check uh, about their mentorship skills and stuff like that? I would have them literally teach someone. Uh, well, I'd have them do a code review, for one thing. Just you know, something simple and regular. See how what their tone is. Just have them actually do it. Have them pair with someone who's a lot more junior, see how they do, how they speak to them, and then maybe have them teach someone something new, have them teach you something new, and how does that go? So I feel like what we actually do is so different from what we say we're gonna do. You have to have them do something, not say what they would do, but in the moment, under stress, what do you do? Because that's who you are, not like what you claim you do. Cool, thank you so much. All right, for that. Thank you. That's been amazing. <laughs>